So we have read in Luke 23, and my thought was this, to go through the seven sayings by the Lord on the cross. And that means he had seven words to say on the cross. Mm -hmm. And often, you know, the number seven in scripture speaks of what is complete. And by going through those seven sayings, you will see the perfections of the Lord Jesus, Yeshua HaMashiach, in a very special way. Now, this afternoon we will not be able to go through all seven of them. That will take too much time. So, I would like to focus on those two that we read today in Luke 23. In Luke 23, the passage that we read, we find the first and the second of those seven sayings. The first is a prayer, as we have read in verse 34, where the Lord Jesus prays, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. So we'll talk about that. And then the second saying is in verse 43, after the, um, one of the malefactors got saved and turned to the Lord with his request, Lord, remember me when you come in your kingdom. The Lord says in verse 43, Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto you, Today you'll be with me in paradise. So this afternoon we want to speak about those two sayings. And um, there are seven in total. And Lord willing, another time we'll see the third, the fourth. And I don't know how fast we will go. But probably today we just have a look at those uh, two, because there is some uh, background information to share with you at the same time. Luke's Gospel speaks about a very special, in a spe very special way, about the Lord Jesus as the Son of Man, but also in connection with God's grace, that God showed His grace by sending His own Son, and. It is amazing when you uh, see the topics in Luke's uh, Gospel uh, being presented and developed, the theme of God's grace is amazing. And Luke is also the writer of Acts. And so you see God's grace showing itself to the nation that rejected their own Messiah. You see God's grace to the nations. In Luke 2, you see the Lord Jesus presented by Joseph and Mary, uh, dedicated to God. And at that occasion, there was a man coming into the temple, his name was Simeon. And he was led by the Holy Spirit. And he took the baby in his arms, and he blessed Joseph and Mary. He didn't bless the baby. We see in Scripture that what is, higher, what is lower, blesses what is higher. No, excuse me. The, it's the other way around. So in order to bless the, the baby, he would be higher. That could not be. Only God is higher than the baby, who is also God. That's a mystery in itself. So he has the baby in his arms, and he speaks about God's light to the Gentiles. He said, this is God's light to the Gentiles and to the nation of Israel. So there you see the message of grace in Luke's Gospel. It is to the Gentiles, and that was proclaimed by a Jewish man, Simeon, and to the nation. God is in control of everything. He knew that the nation was going to reject their own Messiah, mm -hmm. and that then the light would go to the Gentiles. And uh, Acts describes that process. And so in Luke's Gospel you see a special emphasis on God's grace reaching out to the Gentiles and to the nation of Israel because the nation of Israel will be restored and will accept their Messiah. Today there is a remnant all through the ages there has been a remnant of those also among us who have accepted Yeshua HaMashiach as their personal Savior and Lord Messiah. He is the King and so it's a wonderful theme that's developed in Luke's Gospel. But when we focus then on those seven sayings on the cross, one of the reasons I want to do this is that it shows the greatness of His love, that He was willing to go through all these sufferings 
for you and me. It's amazing. You know, soon the Lord Jesus will come and take us away from this scene, and then we'll be around the throne. You can read in Revelation 4 and 5. And who we will see there? The Lamb just slain in the middle of the throne of God. He is God Himself, blessed over all. He is also the Lamb that was slain. He is the Creator God. He is the Redeemer. And we'll see Him. As we be around Him, we'll see Him with the wounds in His hands. The wounds in His feet. The pierced side. I'm going to read later about this. What we have read in verse 23 here in Luke Excuse me, in verse 33, it says there, they crucified him there. The crucifixion is such an awful thing. You know, way back it was invented by the uh, Phoenicians. The Phoenicians were in those days from Tyre and Sidon, they were the conquerors of the seas. Uh, they went all the way to Antarctica, they put Antarctica in chart, they, they made a map of Antarctica, 300 years before Christ. They were the conquerors of the sea. They had tremendous power in North Africa and they invented this way of execution that people who would be criminals would be executed by that terrible form of execution on the cross. And then the Romans later they took over that method of execution. But when you go to Psalm 22, it's amazing. Psalm 22 was written about a thousand years before the Lord Jesus was crucified. And in Psalm 22, you find the details uh, exactly how he was pierced. This is all detailed in Psalm 23, uh, Psalm 22. Um, Many details are given there. I'll just read verse 14. But the Lord Jesus speaks here through, the, through David, through the Holy Spirit, through the prophetic spirit. David was inspired by God to write this psalm. And in these details we see the Lord crucified in t tremendous pain, in agony. And we'll see that the next time when we come to the fourth saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That is the fourth thing on the cross. That is described in Psalm 22. But my point now is that Psalm 22 also describes the physical sufferings of the Lord Jesus. <coughs> Terrible sufferings. But forsaken of God was even worse for him than all the physical sufferings. But for now, I just want to mention verse uh, 14. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. And my heart is become like wax, it is melted in the midst of my bowels. That is just a few words about the sufferings of a crucified one. And this whole psalm, at the beginning of the psalm, speaks of these sufferings. And that is the crucifixion that we have here in Luke 23, in verse 33. So, go back to Luke 23 now. You could also read Isaiah 53, where are a few uh, references also to his physical sufferings. But it says in verse 33 of Luke 23 that he came to a place that is called Skull. So why was that place called that way? Because there people were executed. They were being put to death there. There is a reference in Daniel, Daniel 9. Uh, I'll read that also in connection with this execution. It was all foreseen by God. It, uh, God was in full control. And all these details that happened to the Lord show man's wickedness, but also they show that God's plan was going to be fulfilled. It was prophesied by Daniel in Daniel 9. That um, I'll just read verse... Uh, 30, no, verse 25 Know therefore and understand from the going forth of the word to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah, the Prince are seven weeks and sixty-two weeks the street and the moat shall be built again even in troublous time then verse 26 after the sixty-two weeks so that is four hundred um, okay four hundred 
63 years. After that time, Messiah would be cut off. And that's hap that happened in the year 30 or 33. We are not 100% sure about that, but I think it was year 30. That is the year he entered there in Jerusalem. He came on a donkey, Zechariah 9. There was Messiah. And he would be cut off. That's a reference to the violent death of the cross. The way of execution. He would be cut off. And it says, shall have nothing. That's happening. And that is in fulfillment of prophecy. God is in control from beginning to end. But that doesn't justify man's wickedness. In Acts 2, when Peter looks back to what had happened... And Acts 2 is very uh, interesting what Peter says to the crowd that's listening there to that message on the day of Pentecost. Peter says in Acts 2 that they should repent. And then he says um, that he wants to speak about the Messiah. The, he was a, the man who came from Nazareth in Acts 2.22. He was known as Jesus of Nazareth. The Jews despised him because he came from Nazareth. It was a despised area in Galilee. But he came there in fulfillment of prophecy. All these uh, details are uh, prophesied in the Old Testament. And he was a man approved of God. That's what Peter says in Acts 2.22. How did God show this approval? Remember the heavens were opened and the Holy Spirit came down in the form of a dove and rested on him, dwelt on him. God approved of him. He showed, this is my man. God says, you are my beloved son in whom I found my delight. And the Holy Spirit remained on him. John 1 explains that. And then this approval of God was shown in the miracles, the wonders and the signs that he did. God work those miracles and signs and wonders by the Lord Jesus. God spoke through the Lord Jesus to the nation. And he showed by these signs, yes, he is truly the Messiah. It's not a counterfeit. Yet they rejected him. They didn't want him. And so, because they rejected him, now we see how this is going to work out in the crucifixion. But notice in Acts 2.23, Delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. Man's wickedness is seen there. That they, they got rid of their own Messiah. And they uh, gave him to the hands of the Romans. Ye, the responsible uh, nation, the Jews. Ye have taken and by wicked hands, the Romans. So Jew and Gentile are guilty of the crucifixion of the Messiah. Have crucified and slain. But that's not the end of it. Whom God has raised up, having loosed the pains of death. Because it is not, not possible that he should be holden of it. That is Peter's message. So God's plans were fulfilled. Nothing can stop God. And the amazing thing is that God's plans are fulfilled through the work of the wicked one. What, the, what Satan wanted to do to get rid of the Messiah, what the Jewish leaders did, despite all their actions and their wickedness and their hatred, God's plans were fulfilled. And that is a comfort for us today also. No matter what happens in this world, God is still in control. But that does not justify man's wickedness. Man is fully responsible what he's doing. And so here we see the Lord Jesus in Luke 23, crucified... There were two malefactors. You know what happened? There were re really three. Barabbas was the leader of the insurrection. They were malefactors, but they were uh, convicted of this act of insurrection against Rome. And Barabbas was the leader. And then when Pilate realized Jesus is not a criminal, he's not guilty... Pilate thought, okay, maybe just the leaders are so wicked, they wanted to get rid of their Messiah. Maybe when I give a chance to the multitude, they will say, let him be released. So when Pilate said, here is Jesus of Nazareth, who is also 
Jesus Barabbas, the son of the father, he put the two beside each other in front of the multitude and said, it's your privilege to choose one. You want to have this Jesus Barabbas, that's the criminal, or you want to have this Jesus. He's also Barabbas, the son of the father, and they chose against Pilate's hope, they chose the criminal. And that is a little bit of the background, what happened here. And so Barabbas, who was going to be crucified that day, his place was taken by the Lord Jesus, the innocent one. The Jews accused him of insurrection, he was innocent. The one who really rose up against Rome in insurrection, Barabbas, he got released. He found a substitute, the Lord Jesus was his substitute. And then the two colleagues that he had, the two criminals, here in verse uh, 33, who were crucified. Now if you read very carefully, verse 32 says, we didn't read that, but verse 30, 32 says, there were also two others. Uh, the King James is not uh, exactly uh, very exact there, but it is really there were two who were other than the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus was not a malefactor. There were two others. They were malefactors. And then together, the three of them, the Lord, with the two malefactors, they were led to be put to death. And verse 33, where we started the reading, when they were come to that place called Calvary, or in um, my translation here it says, um, skull. It's really a skull. And so it's not because that hill had the form of a skull, it was the place of execution mm -hmm. where criminals were usually executed. That's why it was called the place of a skull. And that's what we have here in verse 32 and 33. And so there is one in the midst, that's the Lord Jesus. So one criminal on the right hand, one on the left, and Jesus in the midst. We notice from John uh, 19, one at the right side, one at the left, so Jesus in the midst. But it is emphasized in John's Gospel, because in John's Gospel, the emphasis on his greatness, Jesus in the midst. He must always be in the midst. So he's there in the midst of two criminals. And you know, at that moment, what does the Lord Jesus do? Does he complain? Does he speak out against this unrighteousness? He had gone through it. In just so many injustices in this trial, and then people mistreated him, and they uh, rebu uh, they they mocked at him. Terrible things. Not one word of complaint. Here is a word of prayer. That is the first saying on the cross. So in this background, all this hatred, all this uh, injustice, unrighteousness, all these wrong things, the Lord Jesus prays for himself. He prays for those who mistreated him. He says, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. That is such an important prayer. You know, I'll tell you a little story. It's about in the middle of the 1800s. There was a, a Jewish a lawyer from Russia. His name was Joseph Rabinowitz. His uh, sister's fiancé had given him a New Testament. He was a lawyer and he was uh, doing all kinds of things to help Israel and, their, and the Jews in their uh, difficulties. And so one day he thought, I'm going to Israel to see how I can help my people. So then he went, was on the Mount of Olives, and he had taken that New Testament with him. And he was looking around, see all the things going there. Why did it happen to my nation? Why all this trouble? Why all this destruction? Why all this hardship? And then he opened that New Testament. He had not read it, but then he was reminded. He brought that New Testament with him to see the places where the Lord Jesus had gone through and just to be documented, he opened that book and he saw, his eye fell on that verse in John 15 verse 5. Without me you cannot do anything. 
It was like a lightning that hit him. Without me, you cannot do anything. He saw all the efforts that he tried himself to help his people. He saw all the money that the rich Jews were pouring into those projects in uh, Israel to rebuild Israel. And still even today. There are good efforts. I'm not saying anything against that. But as long as they do that in their own strength, it will not be successful. Actually, they will rebuild the temple. But ultimately, who's going to sit in that temple? The Antichrist, proclaiming himself to be God. So all these efforts, I'm not saying anything against it, but they ultimately lead to the fulfillment of prophecy where the Antichrist will be seated there. God foreknew all these things. But now to come back to the story of this man, when he started to study the scriptures, one day he came to Zechariah 12, Verse 10, I'll just read that for you. And that goes together with the topic of the crucifixion that we were just talking about. That's why I bring it up. Zechariah 12, verse 10, God is speaking now in the future. Zechariah describes tremendous sufferings. How in chapter 13 you'll see that uh, one third will be wiped off the map. Two thirds will be wiped off. One third will survive. But then there will be a miracle that will take place. And that is verse 10, Zechariah 12, verse 10. I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look on me, whom they pierced. <coughs> pierced, that's the same expression as you find in Psalm 22. He was pierced. And they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. Only son is here. Yachid means the unique one. And shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. So, if you see the whole context, at the end of the great tribulation, when there will be such despair, then Isaiah 53 explains that too. They will make this confession. They will see him as he comes. This is pierced hands and pierced side. They will see him. They will look upon me whom they pierced. But now, what this this uh, Joseph Rabinowitz find out when you go to the Hebrew, the me, who is speaking here? Jehovah. Jehovah cannot, the Lord cannot be killed. God cannot die. But then it says, whom they pierced. In the Hebrew you see the um, indication of the direct object that is just two letters, it, Aleph and Tau. That is one word and that is not translated, but it is put in, in front of a direct object, whom. So whom is me whom, me is Jehovah, whom is the one who was pierced, whom they pierced, is the man Christ Jesus. And he is, and that's now my point, he is God himself. The first letter of the alphabet, Aleph, the last letter, Tav, of the alphabet, he is the beginning and the ending. He is the Alpha and the Omega. So when this brother was reading in the New Testament, in Revelation you see he is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning, the one who speaks, I'll just read that verse, it is really striking, in Revelation 22, so at the end of the Bible, almost, we see this amazing statement in verse uh, 13. I am, so there is the Lord Jesus speaking, He is also God, blessed over all, I am the Alpha and the Omega, so He's God Himself, He is speaking. And then in verse 13 here, Revelation 22 verse 13. And then he says, the first and the last, that is what he is. And then, the beginning and the end, that is what he does. So in these three statements, we see the greatness of Yeshua HaMashiach, who is God himself, the Alpha and the Omega. He says it, and so it is true. But he is also what he says. He is what he says, and he says what he is. The the first and the last. But then, he's also the beginning and the end. He does everything. 
So it starts with him and it ends with him. This verse shows the greatness of his person. Blessed over all. Everything depends on him. Everything is done through him. He is in total control. That is what we need to understand. And so when he was hanging there on the cross, when we go back to Luke 22, when he was hanging there, God's prophecies were fulfilled. Psalm 22, Isaiah 53, and other scriptures like Daniel I mentioned, and Zechariah. All these scriptures were fulfilled by the one who is in control. So crucifixion is the height of man's wickedness and hatred and depravity. At the same time, it is the height of God's love. There on the cross, God showed who He is. God is love. God showed there on the cross, God is light. That means He's righteous, He's holy. And He did not diminish anything of the of the punishment that came on the Lord Jesus. When He took my place, we'll see that with another saying, when He took our place, God judged Him in our stead. He became the substitute. That is God's grace. That the Lord Jesus, Yeshua Mashiach, would be the substitute, would die, would suffer and die in my stead. Can you say Amen to that? Amen. Praise God. That is unbelievable. That is undescribable. The grace of God seen in this. And that is why he prays here, Father, forgive them. He realizes they're guilty. They're guilty of committing murder. And now he says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Now the same Rabinowitz, what I'm speaking about, he had studies in his home or in, in halls that they rented at that time. And he would speak about the city of refuge. Those who are familiar with this term, in number 35, in Joshua 20, also in Exodus, you find references to the city of refuge. In those days, there were three cities. This side, Jordan, three cities on the other side of Jordan. God had made that provision. And there was also a place, the horns of the, the altar, the tabernacle, was the seventh place of refuge for the manslaughter, for the one who was guilty of manslaughter. So, there was no excuse for murder. If someone would have pre premeditated murder, he wanted to kill his neighbor with an axe and he killed him, there was no mercy for that man. But if they were working together in the woods and something happened, an accident, then the avenger would come and try to kill the one who, who uh, killed his brother or brother-in-law, whether it was. But then the one who committed this act of accidental uh, killing, he could flee to the city of refuge. The city of refuge would open its gates and then the elders would there would examine this man. What did you do? He would give his, mess, his uh, uh, confession. I'm not guilty of murder. This is an accident. So they would keep him in the city of refuge there and the avenger could not enter there, could not kill him. As long as he stayed in the city of refuge, he was okay. Now, what we see in the New Testament, God uses that provision here for Israel. Israel was guilty of having committed, uh, well, some say murder, in, in a sense it was murder, but because this prayer, God did not count it as murder. God counted it as manslaughter. They were guilty of manslaughter. Mm -hmm. And for one who is guilty of manslaughter, there is this provision, when you come to the city of refuge, they cannot get you. And so God's judgment would not fall on them. For those who refuse the city of refuge, so in the book of Acts you find the city of refuge, you find many were saved. And in the beginning of the book of Acts, the church was only of these saved people and then later the Gentiles were, were brought in also but that was the city of refuge that God made for them in Acts 2 and 3 you can see the development then in Acts 7 the leaders rejected that offer but many came like Stephen was saved many came to the city of refuge even Saul of Tarsus he found out when he 
persecuted the, the believers. When he came in front of Damascus, a light flashed around him from heaven. And there he saw Messiah himself. He saw Yeshua HaMashiach in heaven. I thought he was dead. No, he is living there. So Saul of Tarsus, he was convicted by that vision. He saw Yeshua HaMashiach from heaven speaking to him. And even Saul of Tarsus got saved. He entered the city of refuge. There was grace for him and explains it in First Timothy. That God showed grace to him because he had done these things in ignorance. Mm -hmm. If he would have not been ignorant, he would have not been pardoned. Because there is no pardon for murderer. And so this is the importance of this prayer. That on the basis of this prayer of the Lord on the cross there, there could be pardon. And they received it. But that is what we see now with this one criminal that was on the cross. There was pardon for those who would believe. So, God is reaching out to His people on the basis of this prayer. Father, forgive them because they don't know what they are doing. But if they would keep rejecting Him, as you see in the death of uh, Stephen, they kept rejecting this message, then it's over. And only judgment is there. And in the year 70, the whole temple was destroyed, the city was destroyed, one, uh, one million and one hundred thousand Jewish people perished there. But those who had gone to the city of refuge, all those believing Jews, they had left Jerusalem before it was destroyed. More than 100,000 Jewish people left the city of Jerusalem before it was destroyed. Because they were in the city of refuge. So God protected them. So that's a wonderful story. But now we go to the second uh, verse, just to see the connection in Luke 23, verse... Thirty-five. See the people were beholding, they were mocking him. And then the soldiers were mocking him. And also those two criminals, they were mocking him. It says in verse 39, One of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him. If thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. That is verse 39. But in the other Gospels, in Matthew and in Mark, you see that both were mocking him. So, they were hanging down the cross in a desperate situation and still there they were mocking Him. Mm. Can you believe the wickedness of man's heart? But then, can you see the miracle that took place here in verse... Um, thirty-nine and 40? When the 30, in 39, the one mocked at Him if you are the Christ, save yourself and us. See, that was another effort of Satan to get the Lord from the cross. All the leaders who were mocking him, they say, if you are the Christ, come off the cross. Here this criminal said, if you are the Christ, come off the cross and save us also. That was Satan's last effort to get Christ off the cross. Mm -hmm. But he didn't succeed, of course. I sometimes say this, the Lord was nailed with these terrible nails in his hands and feet. It was not the nails that kept him there on the cross. Like, he as the creator of God and the sustainer of the whole universe, he had to give strength to the soldiers to crucify him. And he gave strength to them to do that. He had to give strength to the nails. He's the creator and the sustainer of the universe. If he would change those laws, the nails wouldn't hold him on the cross. So it was not the nails that held him, it was his love, his love for God, that God would be honored by a man, even in that condition. And the love for, for us, that held him there on the cross. And when we will be in heaven, around the throne, we will see him with these wounds. Those wounds will always be there, for eternity. It will show us the greatness of his love. Look, that is how I loved you. And the peace side, and that is quoted in Revelation 1, when you will see him. It is really amazing. In Revelation 1, there is another reference to this. They will behold him, and then we go back to that other criminal again. Revelation 1, verse 7, behold, he comes with the clouds. So that is his 
manifestation and glory. Today we expect His coming for the rapture, to take us away from this world. We don't, we're not waiting for judgment, we're waiting for His coming. But Revelation 1 verse 7 is His coming and judgment. Behold, He comes with the clouds, and every eye shall see Him, even they who have pierced Him. And all the tribes of the land shall wail. That is what we read in Zechariah 12 verse 10. They will lament. And then they will turn to Him through faith. Today a remnant may lament and turn to Him in faith. But then as a nation they will turn to Him and see Him as the pierced one. That was my point to connect that. And so we will see Him as the pierced one. But it is to draw our hearts out to Him to see how He loved us. Now go back to Luke 23 again, where we see then this miracle in the other malefactor. Verse 40, but the other answering, so notice, first he had been mocking the Lord also, together with his colleague there on the cross. But now all of a sudden he changes, he says, and he, re he rebukes his colleague, do you not fear God? So that means... All of a sudden, there was a change in the attitude of this one criminal. He started to see, just in a flash, all of a sudden he thought, This is the Messiah. And I'm a criminal. I'm here because I'm a criminal. He did not do anything wrong. So, in a flash, that the Holy Spirit showed it to this man what was going on. And so, in verse 40, we see that now he is rebuking his colleague and he says, you know, you should also fear God. I have started to fear God. I have started to see things from God's perspective. And now you should do the same. We deserve this judgment. In verse 40 at the end. Verse 41. We receive the just recompense of what we have done. So he acknowledges his wrongdoing. That he deserved this uh, judgment. But then he says... But this man has done nothing amiss. <clears throat> now he is not mocking at the Lord. You see, when Jews who reject the Lord, they speak of that man. They have no respect for him. That's not the way this man speaks. He says, this one, referring to the Lord Jesus, to the Messiah, has done nothing amiss. So he is hanging there, but he's not a criminal. And so this man had a change of heart, a change of understanding, and that brings to verse 42, to his request. He said to Jesus, Remember me, Lord, when thou comest in thy kingdom. So that is a prayer request. And this shows the greatness of the face of this man. He knew he is the Messiah. He is in suffering here. But he is going to have his kingdom. He is going to rule the whole universe. You read Psalm 2, you read Psalm 8. Oh, this man understood everything now. And so he prays, Lord, have a place for me also when you rule in your kingdom. That was an honest request. But what does the Lord say? You don't have to wait till I come in my kingdom. Verse 43, Jesus said to him, and so that's now the second saying on the cross. What is the second saying? And again, the grace of God. And not only to pray for the malefactors, to, for the criminals, but now to show grace to one who changed his mind. The Lord shows grace to him. And he says, yes, verily I say to you, today you'll be with me in paradise. That's God's grace. This man had deserved hell. He gets paradise when he would die. <clears throat> now what does that mean? Uh, we don't have much time, but I'll just mention a few points. And because with this point and this second saying, this promise that the Lord Jesus gives here today <clears throat> means the Lord Himself is going to die and the Lord Himself would be in paradise. See, in the Old Testament, all the believers who passed away, they went to Sheol in the Old Testament. Uh, that's in the New Testament called Hades. But from the New Testament in Luke 16, you can make a note and look it up at home. You see in Luke 16, the Lord speaks about the rich man and Lazarus. 
when Lazarus died, he was carried by the angels and brought into Abram's bosom. That was the department of Hades. Hades means invisible place. That is not hell as it is translated in, in the King James. That's confusing. It is not the lake of fire. It is a place of sufferings for the unbelievers. That's the other uh, compartment. But the place of Abram's bosom is the place of blessing for the believer. So even although they died, they would be in a happy place, in uh, wonderful uh, blessings in Abram's presence, Abram the father of all the believers. And so that is what the Lord speaks about in Luke 16 in connection with Lazarus. But then when the rich man dies, he opens his eyes in Hades, in the invisible place, and he is in a place of torment. That is, he's on the way to hell, but he's not there yet. He's waiting for the final judgment. The final judgment will come in Revelation 20, the great white throne, then all the dead will be raised, and they will stand before the great white throne, the Lord Jesus will sit on the great white throne, and the books will be opened, and he will condemn them, and then they will be thrown into the lake of fire. But this man was not there yet, he was in the place of torments, that is, in anticipation of the final judgment. But it is already too late. At that moment you cannot be saved. Once you are there in a place of torment, it's already settled. You're going to go to hell. You can't change that. Some people think well, if you suffer enough, if you pray enough, and you have many people pray for you and pray a lot of masses, you can get be prayed out of it. No. It's impossible. But now the point. Where is paradise? See what happened... The believers who passed away in the Old Testament, they went to Abram's bosom. That is the department of Hades, what I say. But it is still evidence of the power of death. But what did the Lord Jesus do? He overcame the power of death. He overcame the power of Satan on the cross. He overcame the power of the world, the power of sin, everything. The Lord on the cross, when he said, it is finished, we will come there with the sixth word, another occasion, when he said, it is finished, it was finished, all the work was done. He didn't have to go to hell and fight Satan, he didn't have to go to heaven and present his blood there, God accepted his work on the cross as it was, and when he said, it is finished, it is completed, paid in full, everything was done. Now, on the basis of that accomplished work, the Lord Jesus, what he did, he went to because he died. He went to that place, Hades, where all the believers who have passed away are. And he took all those souls with him to paradise. That is not the point here. You will be with me today. You will be with me in paradise. That implies the Lord would go through that, to that area where the believing souls are, the souls of the believers are, waiting for the day of resurrection. And he would take them away from that place and take them to paradise. I'll read you a verse in Ephesians 4 to explain this a little bit. The tremendous power that the Lord Jesus has manifested when he stepped into death. He overcame the power of death by stepping into death. He went into the lion's den to overcome the lion. Lion, Psalm 22 speaks about Satan's power. And the Lord is the great overcomer. And in Ephesians 4 you find a description of that. <clears throat> so just keep your finger with Luke 23. And in Ephesians 4 we read about the greatness of the Lord Jesus. And I get there. In verse 8. Wherefore he says, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now, gave gifts unto men, that is used by Paul here to explain the different gifts, Ephesians 4, verse 11 uh, and 12. That is the connection of the gifts. But now my point is, the beginning of this verse, he ascended up on high, and led captivity captive. So the Lord Jesus took these souls from Hades, where the believing souls were, and took them with him to paradise, and 2 Corinthians 12 shows that paradise is part of the third heaven. Paradise means a place of 
um, blessedness, a place of happiness. Um, and it is uh, a place of delight. And the most wonderful place you can be. That is paradise. And so the Lord, when He entered paradise, He took all these souls with Him. He led captivity captive. They were not under the power of death anymore. They were now under His power, who had overcome the power of death. And He took them with Him as trophies of His victory to paradise. And that's now the point here in Luke 23. The Lord says, today you will be with me in paradise. He is the great victor. He has absolute victory over all the powers of the enemy, of sin, death. And so that is shown here, that he has, he is absolutely victorious. And this victory is seen in this promise, today you will be with me in paradise. So this second saying on the cross represents the tremendous power the Lord Jesus had. And it shows the grace of God. That's the theme of Luke's Gospel. It shows the grace of God. What wonderful grace for a believer to know, if I die today, I will be in paradise with the Lord. And Paul was put, he was uh, ushered in there. He saw these things. I'll just read that from 2 Corinthians 12. It's an amazing passage. Paul had the privilege to uh, enter there. He doesn't know whether it was in his body or in the spirit only. He leaves it with God. He says in 2 Corinthians 12, I know of a man, in verse 2, in Christ, about 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or out of the body I cannot tell, God knows, such a one caught up to the third heaven. And so in verse 4, he speaks about the same experience, and he says, he was caught up into paradise. So as I said earlier, paradise is a place of delight, and it is a parallel with verse 2. The third heaven, it is, and I heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for men to utter. So Paul had the experience to hear what is going on in paradise. Mm -hmm. You see the happiness of the believers there, with the Lord Jesus. So there is where this malefactor who's, who got saved at the last moment, finds himself in paradise with the Lord. There is where my parents are who passed away, where many believers that I have known who passed away are. They are in a condition of absolute happiness because they are with the Lord. And that's the best thing. And so this second saying of the Lord represents the grace of God. And you know, it was a message to the other criminal he will see one who has received this tremendous promise. God's grace shown to him. The same grace was also available to the other one on the condition that he would repent. And I'm not, I don't know everyone here, but if you have not repented of your sins yet, today is the day of grace. Today you repent to become like the first malefactor who got saved. Otherwise, you will be in Hades and in hell forever and ever. So how solemn this choice is. Everyone has to make a choice whether to be with the one or whether to be with the other. And often in scriptures you find the two. One who make the right choice, the other make the wrong choice. One example in the book of Ruth. You have studied the book of Ruth, right? So you have Orpah and Ruth. Orpah made the wrong choice. They were both daughter-in-law of Naomi. And Ruth made the right choice. And so here, the one criminal made the right choice, the other criminal did not make the right choice. And so that is also a message today, not only a message of grace, it's also a message, a solemn message, because it means if you don't make that choice, judgment is waiting for you. That is very serious. So we'll leave the other saying on the cross, you can study them uh, in the meantime. And uh, Lord willing, I might be back if the Lord still leaves us here at the end of April and we continue with the other sayings on the cross. But if you have a question, you can talk with me after we have finished this meeting. And I would commit all to the grace of God and may the Lord bless His Word and bless each one as we have listened to this message. God bless. Thank you.